and welcome back to iProperty Radio with myself, Carol Tallon. You can contact us on social media at iProperty Radio or by email hello at iPropertyRadio.com. In the PropTech hot seat today is John McDonald, CEO of Recognite. John, you're very welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Carol, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, delighted. So we have profiled Recognite before as one of the interesting prop tech uh, companies scaling out of the UK right now. But you might just remind listeners, uh, what is Recognite and what's the company all about? Recognite is AI powered software for the whole life cycle of real estate. I think that one of the most interesting things about it is it was built out of the needs of true practitioners. Uh, our parent company is Resolute Asset Management, and they, you know, two, 300 people working in all aspects of real estate management. They saw how they could use technology better, how it could benefit their business, started to build some, and now we've taken that and really turned it into products that can benefit everybody. So it's a very good and interesting start. One of the very attractive things I saw in the company when I uh, started to get involved. And um, and, and you, as you mentioned there, when you start to get involved, you're quite new to the role of CEO. When did you take the helm? I am. I came in in November last year. It was one of those things that I got approached about it in the summer and looked at it because my background is much more financial technology and insurance. But when I started to look at these, you see different maturities of use of technology in different industries. And having been insurance, it's quite a long way behind banking in terms of really understanding how technology can benefit you. Because I looked at real estate, it's an enormous global market but it hardly used any technology. And to me, that was fascinating. How you could really make a difference, change how uh, your customers were able to actually use information, change their operations. And ultimately, people have got different objectives of what they want to do. And therefore you need to apply what you can help them with to meet those objectives. Sometimes it's cost savings, sometimes it's better financing, sometimes it's improvement. Um, you really got to go with the flow, when, as they say, when it comes to how is your software really going to be used, bringing it to life in the in the day to day work of the customer. You know, it's it's interesting actually the overlap between uh, prop tech and fintech in the last four to five years, you know, it's really become very pronounced. But I think it's fair to say, you know, there, you talk about the opportunity from the sheer size and scale of the real estate market globally. But the reality is, I, I think we're quite far behind in terms of fintech, not just from when we got started, but actually the impact that's being made and it being embraced by the industry. But I'm saying that not knowing much about fintech. So actually, you've worked across fintech and insuretech. Mm -hmm. Where do you see prop tech and construction technology indeed in terms of its adoption by the industry and market maturity? I'd say it's relatively low. When you, when you sort of look at market maturity, you see early adopters of the leading edge, leading edge technologies. Then you see people starting to become mainstream. I think if you looked at almost all aspects of financial services, it's mainstream. But it's also quite a different industry as, you know, there's a lot of banks, we think. But if you look across Europe, there's a few thousand banks, but there are many tens of thousands of real estate owners from, you know, people that own one unit to people that own 50 shopping malls to people that own hundreds of thousands of units across different markets. So it's really very different in the structure. And therefore, that's what affects adoption. And the other part is, if, if I look at banking, you, you and I go to an ATM, it, it's very structured, isn't it? We get our cash out, it's a digital transaction. It always has been. There's no paper involved or hasn't since 1960, probably. Um, but when you look at real estate, there's still title deeds, there's still lending documents, everything is still very manual. And for me, use of technology really requires you to use the data. And the data is not very structured still in real estate. And that is a, something that really slows down adoption. You know, I'm really glad you used the analogy of the ATM because actually I do believe that the vast majority of our properties, particularly on the residential side, could be transacted with the ease of an ATM transaction because we've had so much progress made in terms of digital mapping. mapping. And I know that that's almost a controversial thing to say right mm -hmm. now, but the reality is it feels like maybe some of our processes are, are sustaining industries. And so the motivation to 
to digitize and just isn't there. But look, that, that's taking us slightly yeah. off track. It's a bigger <laughs> it conversation a for uh, for another day. <laughs> Tell us about the offering from Recognite, because, uh, you know, when you talk about AI powered solutions, you know, what does that mean? Um, so looking across, do you deal on the residential, commercial or both? We, we do both. Um, I think it's important that you are able to look at any type of asset. Um, you, you become very narrow otherwise. So what we look at is the whole spectrum. And if I sort of start off by saying that when you have some basic information about an asset, let's just say we've got a property document, a deed in many countries, and you extract from information from that. Sometimes you even don't have a very precise address. Um, you, you'll know the street name, but do you have the geolocation? Could you find it on a map really easily? Well, the answer is yes, in many cases, but not always. So we're about data enrichment as the starting off point, adding on layers of information. And we do that in many different ways. You know, we'll look at images and we'll, uh, gather the information from that image. We'll go to collateral documentation, lending documentation, and we'll give you a really good picture of an individual asset. And that's the starting point. And that leads you into being able to use operational software. We call it Active Estate that looks after how do you manage that portfolio? You know, repairs, um, what's its value? What do you have to do to be able to get the maximum value out of that asset. Um, and then also we look at individual properties, say a shopping mall, how do you manage that? So it's really three parts of the life cycle, understanding the asset, feeding into day-to-day -day operations of a portfolio, and then an individual asset as well. So I think it's a good mixture of products, but it all comes down to that mixture of software and data and giving insights to let people do their jobs. I, I always have a phrase of a day in the life of an end user. And you know, we all get up in the morning and think, oh, there's certain things we've got to do. Well, people arrive in the office and they've got certain things they've got to do, reconcile their expenditures, whatever it is. I'd rather that they finish that by sort of 10 past nine rather than lunchtime. So they get on and add value in the business. Yeah, you know, when you break it into simple terms like that, you know, of, of course that makes sense. But in terms of the quality of data and the quality of data really determines the quality of the insights and you're going out into an imperfect uh, environment. Yes. So uh, obviously at the moment you're operating primarily in the UK. So looking at uh, UK data sources, um, when you're coming to look at an asset, where, are you, where do you need to source that data from? So the UK is one of our markets and the UK is actually a, a quite a good market in that it has a land registry that's pretty accurate. All the documents are there, uh, most are digitized, um, so you can get pretty good understanding of the title, the, the basic information about it, who owns it, where is it, uh, and some of the key attributes of it. Um, when we look at a lot of the other markets, we're operating again, and we've done a lot of work in what's called non-performing. Uh, loans, non-performing real estate, where it might be repossessions after the credit crisis in 2008, where people are owning portfolios of, say, 10,000 or more properties or assets, and they, they sometimes don't even know where they are. Believe it or not, you know, in some examples in Greece, they think it's a building. Actually, it's a field with a shed on it. And <clears throat> so we're, we're using all of the sources of data that are available to us. And one of those, for example, is, is we look at places of interest, points of interest that surround a property. Because what we're doing is saying, once we've got that basic information, how can we look at its valuation? Because valuation, automated valuation is part of what we do. That's really important because it takes a lot of cost out of operating and understanding your portfolio and even meeting regulatory or reporting requirements. Um, because if you can do it all automated and just sample a few to check, then that's a, a very, very major cost saving. But how can you look at an individual value and say, what should I do? What should my strategy be with that office building? Is it in an area that's improving? Has it got more restaurants that have got you know, high ratings on TripAdvisor? You know, 
is it near uh, a tube station in London's example? Um, are the bus routes changing? What are the demographics that are affecting that asset? Because then you might look, well, actually, I think my medium term view of that asset is I will gain on it or compared to maybe that's an area that's deteriorating or the transport links are not as good as I would like to see, or it's getting run down and inhabited by drug users, whatever it might be. I might want to get out of that asset. So that's what I'm talking about insights, layering on that non-traditional information that gives you a different perspective. Okay, and uh, you know, again, a lot of that is coming from almost crowdsourced. So, for example, when you're talking about uh, reviews, review sites, yes. and things like that. But I can see how um, together layered that can that can paint a picture of an area, or at least certainly uh, the trend of whether an area is going up or coming down. You know, and, and that's a very strong one in terms of the markets that you're operating in. You know, you're mm. first grade. What countries are you operating in at the moment? We're, we're significant presence in Cyprus, Greece, some of the uh, Central and Eastern European countries. Increasingly, we're moving into Italy um, and we're expanding across different markets, some of which have got similar attributes or we see that there's a lot of market opportunity. In the UK, for example, you know, it's, it's a very interesting, say, slightly better developed market in a number of respects, but we're looking at housing associations, for example, owners of, of large estates, because they've got some very interesting requirements coming on them, in, generally in the area ESG, environmental social governance. One, they have governance, but secondly, they're taking longer term views about what are they doing about carbon neutral? Many of these estates in the UK were built in the 1950s, 1960s. So they need to understand those estates and what might they do as they're very long-term owners of these about remediation programs. Actually, sometimes maybe they should sell some parts of the estate to reinvest back into other parts. So we're trying to contribute into the long-term strategic planning for the ownership of these large uh, blocks, using again, what we're talking about, you know, what is um, the, the social environment they're in, but increasingly we're also adding new kinds of insights, which is around carbon footprints. UK is interesting, Portugal has the same, some others, you get a, an ESG type certificate, an energy certificate for an individual property. Uh, you, they don't exist for all properties because they only have to be done when they're sold. but using other factors, we're able to look at images of buildings and make estimates, not 100% not right, but good estimates of the energy efficiency. In fact, in some countries, we're now comparing to the benchmarks for the country and the construction code to say, actually, we can be fairly precise about saying, does that rate from A to F on an efficiency scale? So these, again, are rather different uh, ways of looking at your assets that are partly about investment decisions, but also partly about what should your re future cash flows be for refurbishment? Do I need to borrow long term to be able to do that? What's the payback from reduced um, common heating plant uh, costs, operating costs? These are really very big decisions that, again, I think data is in a very good state if you can collect it and understand what it's telling you, not necessarily to 1% of accuracy, but directionally, where should you be looking to do your sampling to get precision? John, in your opinion, where, where is the average asset owner or um, in terms of their knowledge about either the asset or their portfolio of assets? How, how well do asset owners know their asset? I think, again, that varies because many portfolios of assets are bought and sold. You know, this is the example I was talking about coming out of the credit crisis. They're still being bought and sold, these big portfolios uh, that are being remediated in, in the local language for that. But when you looked at, say, a large uh, housing association in the UK, they know everything probably about every asset they have. If you were to go back through the files, there's are hundreds of pages of documentation. They'll have surveys and reports, but actually 
having that in very usable information, they can see trends and actually make decisions against is quite difficult without the very intense labor uh, of going back and looking at the files. So if you're able to then bring that understanding up to a higher level by either extracting it or extrapolating from some precise examples and say, well, actually, I can make reasonable predictions about other assets based on that without having to do the one by one examination, then you, you're improving your overall level of understanding. Uh, that's how I think it's fair to say people know what assets they have in general. It's just, is that information there and consumable in the way they need it when they need it? John, has it been a transition to move from the financial services into real estate, even though I know the remit is technology uh, and that remains the same, to, to move sectors? Um, are you seeing kind of any cultural differences in terms of attitude to, towards, to understanding the, the, the value of data and I suppose appetite to embrace emerging technologies? I... Interesting one, because I've moved from sort of capital banking, done what they call core banking, the sort of retail banking, insurance, and you see different levels of maturity. We already mentioned that. But when I look at an individual organization, there are really, really bright people working everywhere. And they understand that if, and it's always a big if, they could use what they know or what their institutional knowledge is more effectively or add other information that would benefit them. Sometimes they don't know how they would go about doing it. And that's much of our jobs to be able to say, well, here are the possibilities. And we also have to look at, you know, sometimes it's not realistic to do things. You know, um, I used to do a lot of work in real time trading and we, we did a lot of things that said, actually we could do all of these things but did you actually need it real time or did you need it at the right time? Because you can invest too much sometimes. You need to know when to stop and what the payback you're gonna get from it is. So I think the answer to that in a rather circuitous route is there are individuals and quite large numbers of individuals who understand what the possibilities are and they're looking at how can we do it? It's a little bit of, and it's good to see, Lots of different technology companies, um, prop techs, startups, but also more mature companies saying, we can help you do things. The question will be for the real estate companies and those involved in lending to it and every other aspect around it is which ones are going to give me the most impact, either in the short or medium term, to meet your own individual goals. That, I think, is probably one of the biggest challenges at the moment. Um there is so much in what you've just said there that I, I think the industry will welcome hearing. And the reason is, um, frankly, over the last number of years, a lot of the technology that is setting out to transform the industry is ones that have been maybe enabled to scale because they've been able to access venture capital. But actually, how connected are VCs making those funding decisions to the industry in terms of the needs and wants. So, uh, and I, I think you articulated really well by saying there are lots of problems. There's lots of data that can be looked at. There's lots of pain points that, that can be targeted. It's actually how to prioritize those as a portfolio, uh, um, as a portfolio owner or operator, how do you start to know which problems are the most pressing? And I think ESG is a good is a good kind of metric to use. But even across ESG, there are hundreds, if not thousands of different metrics that could be used there. So how do you know where to prioritize limited spend, understanding that um, th this is not an industry that is comfortable with innovating to the point of trying things and losing money? So All for right. early wins, how do you prioritize? I... You mentioned the ESG. Um, there is a number of things that I tend to look at whenever uh, I'm looking at technology investments in, in industries like financial services. And this is the same because ESG is a very broad topic and it, parts of it are starting to be regulated. 
there is requirements or at least ambitions for net zero or whatever you aspect of that you you're regulated because you you change um there's also expectations and sometimes those expectations are what you need to do or your investors are starting to expect of you i see esg type metrics coming out the rating agencies and these are looking at companies and saying hmm, do they understand esg do they have programs in place they don't actually measure the outcome but that's a slightly different thing so if you're running a um, a real estate organization ultimately what are your objectives and that will be partly what kind are you are you social are you a public company do you have investors and i would tend to be looking in the midterm and saying what's adding to my enterprise value an enterprise value is going to be a couple of things am i getting the best return on my assets and operational efficiency and what can drive that and then when i'm also faced with investors talking about esg much more is what is going to support my esg programs and that will give investor confidence and drive my enterprise value uh, which gives me more choices as i become a more valuable better performing company so it it's a wonderfully broad question carol but i think you really have to take it down to what am i trying to do over the next three to five years and i think you can only look at that time frame because sadly, paybacks in most technology don't happen in six months. Very rarely do they happen. You always try and make sure that you're getting business value after six to nine months, but the true payback tends to take a little bit longer. Given the stage where we are in terms of, I know we've described um, tech adoption across real estate as, as kind of being kind of low on the maturity scale. Um, the reality is most have been using some form of technology for the yes. past 10, if not 20 years. Yeah. Um, so for your clients, when you're going in, uh, presumably they will already have systems in place. They will already have started the, the process of collecting mm -hmm. data to the best maybe advice that they were given, whether it's five years ago or 10 years ago. Um, how, how are you able to, maybe plug in is the wrong word, but how are you able to integrate with the initiatives ongoing for your customers? I'd imagine there's no customers that you go into now that have nothing in place. Um, I'll tell you a little anecdote in a moment, but let's deal with the more serious point on that. Of course, people have something there. And we very much focus on making information open. I almost think of data as a utility. You know, you turn the switch on and the right information should be there. Or you turn the, the faucet, the tap on, and you, you get what you're looking for. So data should be a utility and used across an enterprise. Now, we add analytic tools to do some things. Other people will do other tools, or you might have built something yourself. The sad reality is, and I don't know what you do to run your household budgets, whether you use a lovely piece of software or a piece of paper, I suspect Excel may come into it somewhere. But the most common technology we come across is Excel. Um, there are spreadsheets for everything and some of them are so large. And actually, I think it was, it wasn't McKinsey, but it was one of the other big uh, consulting firms did some research on errors in Excel. And they actually found that something like 26% of all Excel spreadsheets used in actually quite serious regulated industries had a material error in. What percentage? So over 25% had a material error in that you know, had an impact it may not have been a massive impact but if you look back at um, when they were doing quantitative easing in the us they actually made policy decisions on a very major excel error so my point is that excel is used in so many places as the basis of their analysis and technology it's very risk prone it's extremely labor intensive to maintain and adapt and change and there is always that expert in the corner who knew how to build it, who might have left. It's a high risk enterprise using and running your, your business on Excel. John, you promised me an anecdote. You don't need to name names, but have you stories? Well, of course. 
course, one has a few stories, but it, it, and, and the customer will, of course, remain nameless. But the European insurer, again, was doing a lot of regulatory calculations and they missed by not incorporating a couple of key assumptions into a spreadsheet that was their ultimate sort of roll up aggregation of many, many, many outputs from a lot of systems that they were able to make a big capital saving in one particular country due to a classification error of some types of products. Now, that's the kind of thing that can happen. This was, I, I don't know what their internal rate of return was, but you know, it was a good institution, so it would have been fairly high. You know, this is talking about millions of euros of value. And for me, the most important thing is how can we gradually eliminate them? You know, we all use Excel. We're going to, and other tools that are similar. Of course, other products exist, I should say. I'm not a Microsoft salesperson, but you know, these uniquely flexible things that we didn't have in our lives you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago in the way that they are now, open up possibilities, but they don't give you a systemic approach. They don't give you a rigorous way of making sure that you're getting the maximum value out of that data. It's very time sensitive, I need this, I need that, rather than let's make sure our data is available to everyone and analyzed in a common way that allows us all to benefit rather than just the owner of the spreadsheet. That, that's my real concern about the use of some form of technology that helps you do something compared to relatively small investments that allow you to get real sustained benefit. John, uh, you know, you, you've given me loads to think about there, but I'm actually thinking of, my, my mind is still back on the 25% uh, at least of uh, spreadsheets having errors. And is that not the information that's feeding in to any of the tech solutions? Is that not part of the data that you would no, use? No, that, that, that's different. Data is different from say a formula or how do you actually assemble that data? Data is always dirty. It is very rare that you get really clean data. One always tries to improve it, and that a lot of what we're doing and others, but we're, we're focused on taking dirty data, unstructured data, and extracting the really important things out of it and getting the, the insights. So you have to accept that in life. Sadly, you're not going to get perfect data in a non-digitized uh, infrastructure. Governments have not invested in the digitization of all registry information. You can get more geocoding. You can get layers of extra information. You get planning online in most countries, but it's not consistent and the data is not normalized. In other words, it's not structured to always be the same you're going to have to assemble it yourself or rely on someone like us or others to do that for you, to give you that normalized view to the degree that we can. So the Excel issue is different. That's you know, how someone has actually analyzed the data typically afterwards, or they've forgotten to include some data, for example, that was critical. But we and the industry has to understand data is imperfect. How can we make the best of it with a reasonable investment? Okay, and that's reasonable. Um, John, final question. What advice do you have for whether it's portfolio owners or uh, say, as, as you mentioned there, the approved housing bodies who are really building en masse in Ireland at the moment and, and really scaling up. What advice do you have for organizations who are just starting to tackle these issues? I think the, the advice would be think digitally, forward. In other words, start preparing now and for every new thing you do, make sure that you have all of the data and the systems that allow you to see it and then gradually roll in all of the older legacy information to constantly be improving it rather than take a big bang approach and say, let's go for it, get every file and digitize it. That, that's not going to help you. But the, I often find the best way to roll these programs into an organization is start with the new and then work backwards where you see it's going to add value. And eventually, and I do say eventually, and sometimes you'll never get there. I did have a life insurer once that said, we're never going to change that system. It's 50 years old. 
and there's only 2,000 policies still on it. Sadly, most of those people will die fairly soon. There's no point digitizing or changing that system. So work out where the biggest bang for the buck is, essentially, and start on the journey. I think that's great advice from procurement point of view. So thank you so much. That was John McDonald, CEO of Recognite. And that's it from the PropTech Hot Seat this week. You can get in touch with the show on social media at iProperty Radio or by email at hello at iPropertyRadio.com. My thanks as always to Hear Me Roar uh, production team and to Luke Delaney on sound for Dublin South FM. Until next time, thank you for listening.